On today's episode, part two of our Relationships and Money series with Jillian Johnsrud. Welcome to the Ultimate Crowdsource Personal Finance Show. This is Choose FI. All right, guys, thanks again for joining us. Uh, this is a lot of fun. We're actually going to be picking up and continuing our conversation with Jillian Johnsrud. So many of you uh, answered that call to action that we put out uh, to our subscribers. What are you getting hung up on with regards to relationships and money? What are you know the questions that maybe you're posing to your significant other or the roadblocks that you're bumping into? Let's try to build a framework about around this and, and put some best practices into place. And Jillian has done, uh, this really is her body of work and really where she's leaned in the most significantly over the last couple of years. So make sure you're first and foremost, go back and listen to the Monday episode that just went live. This will be a continuation of it. Super excited to dive into it. And to help me with this, I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan, I am doing quite well. Yeah, what's going on by you? Well, uh, I woke up this morning and I had uh, broccoli and hummus. Uh, <laughs> I know okay. like, dude, I really don't, I really don't care what you had for breakfast. It really is not why I tuned in this one. I hear you. I hear, but where I was actually going with that is that I am trying to detox post, you know, Christmas post new year's. I found that, you know, in the morning you could pick between a bagel and the flavored cream cheese or the bowl of cereal, whatever. And then I've just noticed that has started to become my norm. You know, the heavily processed carb heart carbohydrates, even if they're quote unquote healthy, um, and I'm just like, you know what, maybe I'm getting to be a little bit too dependent on that and went back to broccoli and hummus. And all of that was made a little bit better, a little bit easier by the fact that the sun is shining outside. Like it's just less depressing weather out there. It looks like we're moving into spring. Oh, it's so nice. Yeah. Today is a beautiful day here in Richmond VA. It's going to be in the sixties and sunny. And I mean, March is here. It's, it is wonderful. And yeah, it's funny because so sun is shining today, but Jonathan, we obviously we've had a couple of crazy ice storms in the last couple of weeks, just out of nowhere, like to the point where you called me, we actually lost power. We had a sense that we were going to lose power conceivably because it looked like the, you know, the weatherman was saying, Oh, you know, stay tuned, stay tuned. But you called me frantic, like, what is going on? What, where'd the power go? Like you had no idea there was even ice storms, you know, in the offing basically. And <laughs> so that was, that was a, a funny, well, funny Andrew, phone call. Andrew Frieden, our, our, our local weatherman who is amazing. I mean, he was really, really concerned about the, and, and to be fair, Texas got the, the real deal, right? I mean, they got the real deal, but I think that was the same level of, that Andrew Frieden had for our local area. And yeah, I was oblivious, but when I called you, you're like, oh yeah, it's about to hit the fan. <laughs> yeah. Andrew has, has become a good friend of ours and he's a good friend of the shows obviously. And, uh, yeah, I mean, they were talking with like a once in 30 year type ice storm. So the reason why we're bringing this up actually is Jonathan, this was the first time that I have used travel rewards points in over a year. Oh my goodness. And you're back in the game. <laughs> yeah. Back in the game. The, and I have to say this highlighted this highlighted the power and the value of having rewards points. So basically my wife, I mean, it was gonna, It was in the 20s degree wise that day. And we had feared that we were going to lose power. It was a Saturday and 8 AM, the power blinks off and 8 30 rolls around nine o'clock rolls around. Nothing's happening, you know? So we're fearing the worst, fearing it being, you know, 30 degrees in our house. And I'm like, you know what? We have a Hyatt that's a category one Hyatt place about three miles from us. Let me call them and see if they have power. And if so, I'm just going to hop on the app and book a room almost just why not? Right. It, it's five. It was 5,000 points. So clearly there is an opportunity cost to that, right? Like if I had used those as chase ultimate rewards and I redeemed them, it would have been 50 bucks. But for me at that point, having a family of four sitting there in a cold house saying, Oh, this, this looks pretty good. Let's see what happens, right? Like it wasn't like a speculative booking. It was, wow, this is really a great case study of how valuable these points can be. That's amazing. Yeah. And that's, I mean, so walk people through with the, with the, when you're redeeming at Hyatt category one versus category five, you know, what do people look for in terms of a great redemption via, via Hyatt? Yeah. So Hyatt is one of our favorite rewards programs just because their, their award chart is phenomenal. So whereas if you use rewards points to book at, let's say a Marriott or a Hilton, if you have, have those points, those are the most ubiquitous of all hotels, right? There are thousands and thousands of worldwide Marriott and Hiltons. There simply aren't that many Hyatts, but there are many, many hundreds of them 
in the US. So you're most likely in, in a, a normal sized city, you're going to come across a Hyatt. So they're not like, it's not that few and far between, but the beauty is unlike with Marriott and Hilton, where you're spending 30, 35, 40,000 plus points for just one night in like a middling type, you know, nothing special Marriott Hyatt, you can find some amazing deals. So the category one Hyatts, which are generally like the Hyatt house or Hyatt places. And in normal non COVID times, they have free breakfast, which are fantastic. So you're actually getting more than at like a ritzy type hotel. You're getting a free breakfast, a nice place to stay. And category ones are 5,000 points a night. And category twos are only 8,000 points a night. So the nice thing with Hyatt is that they are a transfer partner of Chase Ultimate Rewards. So you have these points sitting in your Chase account. We've talked about this, Jonathan, so many times that Chase Sapphire Preferred is our number one credit card that we recommend. It's, uh, It's just a phenomenal card, largely because of these Ultimate Rewards points, right? And the flexibility. So when those points reside in your Chase account, you can then transfer them to, they have more than a dozen hotel and airline partners. So they include some of our favorites like Southwest, United, Hyatt, and actually British Airways, but that's that's a, a, a sweet spot that's Brad's maybe taking outside you, the now, now Brad is taking you from just a local Hyatt to here's <laughs> how I can get you to Europe. You know, here's how I can get we you to- We are going deep. <laughs> <laughs> We're going deep here. But, but anyway, they, that's what's so beautiful about those points is you can send them at a moment's notice to those programs. So they have all the flexibility sitting in chase, right? And then when you need them, so in this case, I have, you know, X number of hundreds of thousands of points sitting in my chase account. I can say, okay, I need 5,000 points right now at Hyatt. I can log into chase, transfer them real quickly to my Hyatt account. They transfer to most programs instantly, like literally the time it takes you to log out and log back in that type of instant. And then 5,000 points show up in my Hyatt account. I booked this Hyatt place and we had a room and it truly is that simple. You, again, you could do that. You could put together an entire trip. If you were flying on Southwest or United staying in a Hyatt, I mean, it's, they're really, really convenient. So I happen to have, in in this case, I did have some Hyatt points lying around enough to, to cover the 5,000. But for me, nine times out of 10, I'm just keeping my points at chase and transferring them. All right. So, yeah, so this is, there's a couple different levels to this type of play, but really I think that the, what what stands out to me is the travel industry is coming back and hospitality and entertainment industry are coming back, but some people are going to be slower than others to start booking those tickets. What does that mean? It means that travel rewards will fill the gaps, you know? And so the opportunities and the redemptions are going to be amazing in the travel reward space over the next year, year and a half. And so you want to have those points. That way you can capitalize that if you're willing, you know, and and have the uh, desire to do a little traveling when maybe other people aren't. So, yeah. Yeah. Agreed totally. And I think the nice thing is, and we've talked about this for years on the podcast, just about travel rewards generally. And this time is, is probably the best example of this is you always want to plan ahead, right? So even if you're not comfortable traveling right now, but you, you know, maybe by the end of 2021, you are into 2022, start stockpiling these points. And like you said, there are going to be a lot of availability to use frequent flyer miles. And that is a wonderful thing, right? Like there aren't going to be significant blackout dates. There's not going to be as much competition to, to book these spots. So if you have the points in hand and you're ready to, you know, with some flexibility, Hey, we want to go to Hawaii. Hey, we want to go to Europe, whatever it may be, you're going to have a lot of, lot of chances. So yeah, highly, highly recommend getting started. Jonathan, we have a free travel course. I know this hasn't been something we've talked about too often in the last year, unfortunately, but for anybody out there looking to learn more about using rewards points, we think this is a way to save potentially thousands of dollars a year. So you can find that at chooseify.com slash travel. And that card I mentioned is the Chase Sapphire Preferred. And we have a really, really in-depth review on that at chooseify.com slash CSP. So it's CSP for Chase Sapphire Preferred. Yeah. And I think the reason you come back to that is it's flexibility. It's a wild card. In any game, it's always good to have the wild card. And that unlocks that. So with all these different ideas, Hyatt at a, you know, one star, five star, whatever, Hawaii, Europe, anywhere, like 
we can figure that out when we get there. But if you go back to the source of that, you know, this last card that you just mentioned basically gives you unlimited freedom and flexibility when it's time to redeem with all of the different uh, partners that are out there. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and switch gears and we're going to invite, and Jillian's gonna be joining us back on the show today. We're continuing our conversation relationships and money. And I think I would just say uh, for individuals out there, you know, this is a primer. You know, like if there is a question between this episode and last episode that wasn't mentioned, please let us know. We want to follow up on this. I will just say that we're planning on doing a bunch of these types of episodes. And the next uh, roundup that we have planned is we're going to do one around building a business, uh, specifically now, you know, we, right now this is being recorded in 2021. And, uh, is this the best time to start a business? Is it the worst time to start a business? I mean, I know where I fall on that spectrum, having kind of gone through this, uh, but it would be inter interesting to see what questions you have and what concerns you have. Uh, what what does that spark? And if if that does interest you or excite you, we're planning on having Alan Donegan join us on the show within the next uh, month or so. And if you would like to submit a question to be featured on that show, much like we're airing this episode today, uh, just submit your voicemail. Go to choosefi.com slash voicemail. And, you know, let us know you have a question for Alan. We'll play that on an upcoming episode that features him along with your question. So that's just kind of the idea, Brad. How can we crowdsource and bring in these, really these experts in these different spaces uh, to bring these questions to life for the larger audience? Yeah, you stole my thunder there. That's exactly what I was going to say on the, both the in-house experts and on the crowdsourcing side, right? Like we have talked about both of those concepts for the four-year life of Choosefi, that this is not about us. This is about the community. This is about your wins, what you're doing, the actions you're taking and your questions, right? And also we've said, this cannot be limited by our knowledge. So we have these amazing in-house experts on essentially every topic that exists in the FI world from real estate to taxes, to relationships like Jillian and building businesses, the stock market drawdowns, you know, anything that people have questions on, we have friends of the show who can come in here and talk at a world-class level. So I think we're going to really try to do this. Jonathan, I mean, I, I would say once a month at least, right? We can take people's voicemails on a very specific topic. And like you said, we're going to do building businesses with Alan Donegan this upcoming month. So just go to chooseofi.com slash voicemail and leave your voicemail for us and for Alan. And we're going to do an entire show or potentially shows on that specific topic. And then we'll move on, you know, we'll make an announcement on the show. And again, we want this to be about you and your questions. And Jonathan, we've actually had a pretty cool, successful thing. We've, we've long wanted to do a radio show taking live questions. And we're actually, that's kind of coming to fruition uh, to a large degree, let's say. We've been piloting it secretly, not so secretly on stereo. Uh, and it's a 10 week experiment just to see, can we recreate a radio show basically that is interactive, allows us to interact with you directly. So if you want to jump the line, you have a question for, you know, either of us, both of us, uh, and you want to join us over there, we're going to be on stereo for the next, uh, you know, eight or nine weeks. We had, we've gone, we've done two of these every Tuesday. It's at seven 30 PM Eastern time. We spend about an hour to an hour and a half, just taking questions and uh, just interacting with you guys. It's been really fun. And, uh, we hope to keep it going. If you want to get the link for that, to join us, uh, just go to choosefi.com slash live. It will give you all the information to download the app so that you can participate and listen. And then, you know, from your phone, you'll actually be able to submit voicemails directly while we're having the show. And uh, we have had, uh, there's been some technological hurdles trying to take a podcast and push it onto a phone uh, live, uh, but we keep getting better. And uh, we are now excited that uh, you guys can join us over there and bring your enthusiasm, your energy, and your questions along with you. So I think, all of these kind of experiments running in parallel or us just figuring out, we have this, this banner, you know, crowdsourcing personal finance, let's live that out. And, uh, that means we need your help and you are, you're, you're taking us up on the challenge. Okay. With that, let's go ahead and switch gears. We're going to bring Jillian onto the podcast. All right, everyone. So we're picking up our conversation on relationships and money with Jillian Johnson. Jillian, welcome back to the show today. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is going to be a lot of fun. Now, when we talked, when we kicked off uh, the prior episode, relationships and money, we'll, and Brad can give us an episode number in just a minute here. But when we kicked off that that prior episode, we were really able to look at it on how do you start 
diving into your, your, your past money story and, and realizing kind of what it is that motivates you and creates fear as it pertains to money and relationships. We were also able to take a look at two individuals that are kind of at different stages and individuals that have different goals and how to merge those together. Highly recommend that people go listen to that episode. And Brad, do you by any chance know that episode number top of mind right now, if people want to start with that? Yeah, Jonathan, that's actually episode 300 that released on uh, March 1st of this month. So yeah, episode 300 with Jillian. All right, perfect. And you can go to your podcast player, just go to chooseify.com slash 300. Now today uh, we have a couple more of these questions that our listeners have actually submitted and Julian's going to be, we're going to be take using them as opportunities to really explore, I think, common themes that all of us inside the community have, have struggled with. And this one is a little bit about, can you be financially independent if you're still dependent? And uh, we got a great question, which we're teeing up right now from Asia about this very topic. Hi, Jonathan, Brad, and Jillian. Um, my name's Asia, and I'm calling in to get a perspective on a situation so I'm currently engaged to my lovely partner of three years and we'll be getting married later this year. Um, we do have a slight age difference. So I'm 27, she's 23, and I work full time while she's completing her graduate degree. So she also does have a part time position, which does help us in bringing income into our household as well. Um, we both had like really different money stories growing up. So I supported myself through college and she was luckily able to get support from her lovely, awesome parents. And right now, you know, we've been combining finances as we start to transition our lives from from two separate entities to to really becoming one when we get married later this year. So my partner currently has some things that are being taken care of by her parents still financially. So those things are her car insurance, the property taxes for the car. It is a fully paid off car that they've already taken care of. Um, and then also her health insurance and up until recently her phone bill, which we just switched over to my plan this past month. So my partner is really ready to gain some more financial separation from her parents in order to really increase her own independence and, and start our lives together as, as a separate entity from them. And I really want to support her and make sure that she has that autonomy as a, an adult. But I still can't help this little voice in the back of my head that says, like, if her parents are really willing to take care of those few things until she finishes grad school in May of um, 2022, then to really just let them, especially the health insurance part, since her parents pay the same rate for all of the kids, the same premium for all of them on the health insurance. So taking her off and like getting her own insurance or adding her onto my insurance, which would be an extra uh, fee, an extra premium, wouldn't really change their premium at all. So we know you may not be able to give us a like a this way or a that way of how to solve this or how to walk through this, but we'd love to maybe hear some pros and cons of this scenario and how you think about moving forward. Thanks, y'all. Appreciate it. Awesome. All right, Jillian, well, let me give you like three things that come up just in terms of I'm curious how, what struck you the most and where you want to lean in with this, but how much of this is you know, just like psychological, what it means to you to have these attachments, how much of this is boundaries and how much of this is like pure economics. That's kind of like the three different things that <laughs> yeah. stuck out to me that you want to kind of navigate as you piece together the perfect solution to this dilemma. Yeah, I think there are a few elements. One for me was how, how to start to feel like a financial grown up. I think is one of the issues, like what kind of habits and practices can her fiance take to where she feels like she is a financial grown up in this relationship. She's an equal partner in this relationship. She's not like just someone's child married to an adult. Uh, sounds like one of the kind of dynamics. Um, and then I would also look at it as what does it mean to receive from her parents, but also what does it mean for her parents to give? Because there's two two sides of that coin, and I think both should be considered. You know, it's interesting, and, and Brad, I'll give this to you because I, I know you probably have some thoughts as well. I don't personally have if if boundaries are fine. There's no boundary issue. There's no communication issues. There's no 
this has strings attached issue. I don't personally yeah. have fine taking help and providing help. You know, to that point we talked about in a prior conversation, community is everything. And we just don't have that. We don't have that multi-generational wealth building. We have the scarcity mentality. I don't personally have a problem accepting help or giving help one way or the other, but all of that is through the lens of our boundaries in place. Are there strings attached that this is keeping me from fully, you know, accessing my adulthood, I guess. But Brad, I know you're, you have an interesting story with regards to, you know, uh, help from your family and it probably is, you know, it pertains to this a little bit. Yeah. It's funny, Jonathan. That's exactly what I wrote down as, as, uh, the question was coming in about, are there strings attached? That's verbatim what I wrote down. Are there strings attached? I, I think those, those are things that, you know, it's, it's impossible to tell from, from this voicemail. It sounds like it's a positive environment and it sounds like her parents have to pay $0 extra for, for the healthcare. So it seems like it could theoretically be a win-win here. And like, I'm not someone who says like, oh, to be a grown up, I need to do X, right? And I think that's where, as you're alluding to, like where my story comes in, which is after graduation from college, you know, I, I got a great job at, at a major international accounting firm and I still lived at home. And sure, was that like, if I had to prove to somebody else, like, oh, I'm some big adult, like, would, you know, living in my parents' tiny little spare bedroom, like, would that have fit the bill? Probably not. But the thing is, I wasn't trying to impress anybody. I was trying to save a boatload of money. And thankfully, like, my parents were, didn't charge me rent. You know, that was a decision they made. And I was able to save really 90% of my income, which propelled me, basically, that was the jump start that I needed to get on this path to FI. And, you know, obviously I understand how fortunate I am. I'm not saying this is necessarily replicable for everybody, but I think it's more the mindset of my parents were thrilled to have me there. I was not too proud. I didn't need to be a grown up. I didn't need to prove it to anybody. And I was able to save a lot of money and that, that helped my entire life dramatically. I'm not sure I would be where I am today if it wasn't for that. Uh, I certainly wouldn't be as far along. So, you know, I, I think that's kind of the mentality. And obviously I know I'm biased in this situation because I, I lived through that, but that's kind of how I would approach this mentally with, you know, with Asia here is, is like, find out, are there ulterior motives? Are there strings attached? Jonathan, like you said, are there boundary issues that potentially like there are families obviously who control people with, with money? You know, it, again, it doesn't sound like that from this situation, but like, that's what you need to ascertain, not, and, and once you figure that out, then you can look at just the nuts and bolts of the actual money situation here, right? Like if it doesn't cost the parents any money extra and you don't have to pay extra in healthcare premiums, like to me, that sounds like a win-win, all things being equal. Right. The trickle down of that, that I wasn't totally clear on, and, and maybe you can step in here is what's happening at tax filing season with dependents versus not a dependent. If that is a factor in some way in this conversation, uh, and in particular with the healthcare, not obviously not the cell phone, but with the healthcare, um, if there's anything there, because there might be something along the lines of child tax credit, there might be something along the lines of claiming, um, you know, there might be some benefits that are being lost one way or the other that might be important to root into to figure that out. But assuming none of that's in place, then yeah, I mean, I don't personally have a problem with the economic thing, but I'd hate for, because they don't have ownership of the healthcare, because they don't have ownership of the cell phone, you know, they don't, to Jillian's point, back to you, Jillian, like you don't also feel like you have any agency or control over your retirement or your future planning or your goals for your money. And I think that is, is it stunning your financial growth? So I think, and we'll get into this in a second, I think there's some things that you can do to kind of write your own rules of what does it mean to be a financial grown-up. You don't have to just assume society's rules or other people's rules, you know, kind of to Brad's point, like in his rules, he could live at home and be a grown-up. And, and there wasn't any contradiction there. We each get to decide that for ourselves. Um, so I think that there's some habits that we can put in place that would help her be a financial grown-up by her own definition. The family aspect, I have, I have two stories, experiences of like how this plays out on the other side of the coin. When, so I got married at 19, um, 
very young. My family wasn't super excited about this. And I had one family member who was paying for my cell phone and said, well, if you get married, you're on your own. If you get married, I'm, we're not, we're cutting you off. Like we won't pay for anything. And I said, so paying for my cell phone wasn't to help me get through college. Paying for my cell phone was to prevent me from getting married. Like this doesn't, this doesn't make sense. Like what was your intention of paying for my cell phone? Cause I'm still going to be going to college. Um, but I was like, fine, whatever. If that's your deal, cool. And I think for parents on, on the parent side, a lot of parents want to help their kids go through school. They want their kids to finish school. It's not conditional on, we want our kids to be single. Like if you found someone and you're happy and you want to get married, yes, as long as you finish school. Um, so letting your parents help in that regard is, it's kind of nice. Um, The other situation when I got married is another family member offered me $10,000 if I would wait a year. And it kind of felt like a bribe. A little bit like a bribe right now. It's aged (laughs) like a bribe. (laughs) It it has. And, And I said, well, that's really sweet. But like my choice isn't for sale. Like my life isn't for sale. If, if you want to give me $10,000 next year for us to like have a honeymoon or to do something else, like that's amazing. And I would appreciate that. But like the choice of what day I get married is, is mine. And it's like not up for auction to the highest bidder. So I'm sorry. Um, no, thank you. (laughs) And so kind of those boundaries of like, is this gift like present? Is it with strings? Are there other issues? Are there other conditions? But if your family just wants to help you get through school, I think that's a sweet thing. Um, and, and sometimes giving your parents those wins (laughs) is, is a nice thing to do. Um, the other side is how to be a financial grown up. And kind of like we talked about in the other, you know, in our last episode, I think there's some things that you could do, some little milestones, whether it's, you know, in, in my course, I have kind of 21 lessons and it's things like tracking your expenses, figuring out what your gap number is each month, coming up with like a debt alloc- repayment plan, coming up with your allocation plan for your gap. If, you, if you're doing all of these other things, I think you'll very quickly start to feel like a financial grown up. And if you're sitting down and having that one hour meeting every month, you'll feel like a financial grown up because the reality is, despite the fact that your parents are paying for your health care, you will be more of a financial grown up than like 80 percent of the U.S. population. Yeah, either there is if you can have a, a grasp of what's going on in your financial life, you understand what your money story and you understand what your goals are and what your current trajectory is and how these variables, when they inevitably do stop at some point, the cell phone goes away, the health insurance goes away you know, other bills increase. You understand how that affects your financial plan. You are absolutely a financial grown up. And uh, Brad, the one thing that you said in there that I want to come back to is if we can start this process of realizing what it means to be a financial grown up sooner, that does manifest in our interactions with other individuals, with our parents. I mean, that's pretty clear when someone's got a good head on their shoulders and that they have a plan for their, for their money, that they're acting with intention. So many people are just drifting and we figure out at 30, oh, this stuff matters. And now we'll try to, you know, we'll try to do better with it. If you're in your early twenties, late twenties, and you start to put this together, it, it come it becomes very clear to those around you that you are a financial grown up. And in the, in light of that, the thing that I want to push back on is that what if someone makes the choice, their strategic choice in lieu of, you know, all the boundary stuff, not, you know, being taken care of that Jillian was talking, Jillian, her money story and her parents' money story, there's a lot of boundary issues there. Like it, it comes through, yeah. right? Your money story <laughs> comes through with a lot of boundary issues. I mean, that, that carries with you into other things, but if those are not there and we need to be very intellectually honest about whether or not that applies to our situation, if we have that open relationship with our parents where we can uh, do that, I, I think the idea of Brad's situation, your parents are, are, are good with it. They want to help you out in some way. One of the things they have is an extra bedroom. You see a mercenary way in order to use that for a couple of years to massively pile up some cash to achieve your goals. Listen, these coast fi numbers that you hear us throw around, they're real. 
if you can save up a hundred thousand dollars in your twenties, you know, where everybody else, me, you know, Jonathan graduating at 28 with this great six figure income and $168,000 of student loan debt, you have no debt. You have a hundred thousand dollar net worth as you go into 25 to 30. You've broken the game. You could just be like, you could literally just be on a paycheck to paycheck basis for the rest of the time to your fifties or sixties. You're going to be a millionaire either way. So just realizing the implications of what does it mean to be a financial grown up and taking advantage of these opportunities, but doing so in a very respectful manner. We do not want to take advantage of our relatives, but if our goals are aligned, they want to see us succeed and we have the opportunity to do this. I have no problem with it. And Brad, I think that in, in some ways it's great that your story is highlighted because people don't hear enough examples about that. We always hear about how it goes wrong. You can't get the kid out. Yeah. And I think, I think this is kind of part of a larger second generation FI conversation, right? And while it's not, it's, it is relationships and money, right? It's not exactly the, uh, the type of relationship we're talking about here generally, but, but in the broader relationships, I think there are different ways to conceptualize that second generation FI, right? Like how, I look at it is, yeah, if I can help my kids, you know, at some point in the not too distant future, my kids are going to be graduated from college and, and getting that first job. If I can help them and I know that I've, I've, they're responsible kids. They're not just kind of loafing and doing nothing. Like, of course I'm going to help them out as much as I possibly can, but, but that's my choice. And that's not to imply that that's the right choice for everybody, because I think there's an equally valid case to be made for hey, let's teach financial skills in a safe way of, you know, you hear people in the FI community saying, I'm going to charge my kids rent. I'm going to, you know, have them pay on a certain date of the month, you know, to, to kind of make it akin to real life. So I, I fully respect that. I think for me and where, where I come down on this is that I hope to impart this type of education on my kids throughout their entire childhood. So I'm not going to need to give them some stark lesson at 22, that first day that they, they have a paycheck coming in. So if I can help springboard them, and again, I know what kind of fortunate position that is, but if I can help that, of course I'm going to do that. So yeah, that's kind of how I come down on this. And, and yeah, I'm glad it can be, it can be useful because I think this is an interesting strategy to help your children in a way that's not actually just handing them money. You know, it's, it, it's not all that far off, obviously, right? Because you're not charging expenses. So, so I understand uh, how tenuous of an argument that is, but, uh, but it, it is an interesting concept. I interviewed, um, Bobby and Coral Hoyt on my podcast and they, while they were trying to pay off their student loan, loan student loan debt, after they got married, they moved in with her parents, I think for a year or two. Um, while they paid all of that off and and started saving. And he said it was an amazing experience. Um, and her father ended up getting sick during that year. Um, I think eventually passed away. And they just, like, that's one of the most cherished moments in their marriage was getting that time with him and being able to be there to support them. And if you can nurture that kind of warmth and intergenerational love and support, like, that's amazing. Um it's definitely like my my family trajectory going forward is what I'm hoping to create. All right. Uh, and Brad, you know, with and as we mentioned, kind of this codependence in some degree on, on each other, I think it's important to point out that it seems that this is something that America needs to be reminded of because many other cultures, this is not like an outlier. This is just what you you do. And, and, and I know that that is the case. In fact, uh, we had Tay on, he writes over at financialtortoise.com and he was on our show episode uh, 186 talking about multiple generations under one roof. This is the game plan. This is the expectation. This is what you do. It's not the exception. It is the rule. Uh, and I think other cultures hear us talking about this as an outlier and say, what? Like, no, I'm, I am, I am doing this. This is what I have to do. Like it is built into kind of my code of conduct, if you will. So I think for some individuals, check that episode out. If you're interested in it, it's uh, chooseafi.com slash 186. And he's actually going to be coming up on an upcoming Households of Fi episode in the very near future here. So you'll be able to hear that uh, episode as well. But um, I think it's good for all of us just to be reminded that this it can be something that can be absolutely positive. And it's all about framing and it's about communication and understanding. All right, uh, Jillian, I think we have one more voicemail today. Yeah, we have Precious and it's, the very simple question that we've all, if 
you're especially in a partnership, a marriage, you cross this bridge. How do we start to combine our finances? Hi, I have a question. So I'm getting married in a few months and I am interested in learning about like some of the best resources or best ways to combine finances. We're relatively young and so far we do Zelle and sending money back and forth. But I'm looking for a more efficient system in either opening up a credit card or having a joint account. Thank you. And I really love what you guys do. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Precious. And thank you for the voicemail and congratulations as well. Yeah. I mean, this is a, uh, this is a huge question and it's a little scary when you're, when you're going from like maybe trying to start a plan, a financial plan, but realizing, all right, well, I need to do a financial plan for myself, but I also kind of need to do a financial plan for this, you know, this entity that we're creating together, this marriage that we're, we're about to enter into. So there's more participants, there's more complexity. And, uh, this is just the beginning of a much larger conversation. So Jillian, what stands out to you? And she mentioned Zelle, which is like a peer to peer, uh, payment system and, uh, maybe opening up a credit card. Uh, do we start there or do we maybe take a step back? Oh, so I, you know, I'm, I'm a romantic and I, I love to think that all love will last forever and nothing will ever go wrong. <laughs> um, I would not open up a credit card with, um, with your partner, with a spouse, those first years of marriage, because I've seen credit card bills get divvied up in divorce and settlements. And it sucks to get divorced. Usually it's a painful process. But when you also get 10 or 20 or $30,000 of your ex-spouse's credit card debt that you are now on the hook to pay for over the next few years, like it is a bitter pill to swallow for a long period of time. So I wouldn't, I would keep your guys' credit cards separate. Um, each have your own, like don't, don't co-sign those credit cards. That's the one thing early in marriage. Um, if, if you have the ability, I would keep those things separate. Um, but getting married, it's a great time to open up a joint bank account. Um, cause worst case scenario, you spend the money that's in there, but you can't go like $40,000 in debt with it. So, and it can make that kind of passing money back and forth, which, um, is maybe a more impromptu, less organized method. You guys can really sit down and figure out joint bills, joint shared expenses, how much people contribute if you want to kind of take a baby step towards joining your finances. Yeah, Jillian, this is interesting. So, right, if we if we hear Precious's uh, voicemail and, and we kind of presuppose that the ultimate goal is completely combined finances. And I know that's, that's, a you know, a logical leap here, but let, let's just assume that's the ultimate goal. So I guess your thought is like, almost like a, like a baby steps, right? Like let's take small actions that will get us on the same page. We'll open those lines of communication, right? I think that goes back to our first episode, episode 300, where, you know, we spent a significant time just talking about communication. That's the fundamental bedrock of all of this when it comes to money is, Let's just try to talk. Let's try to get on the same page. Let's try to see where do we, what are we coming into this relationship with, you know, mentality wise, right? And then we can move forward. So I guess you're saying the, the very first thing that you most likely would advise people to do is to open up a combined checking account, right? Is there, yeah. just confirm that for me. And then like, wh how, what would be maybe like, you know, in theory, like a next step or two that someone could take? I think, you know, combining all of your finances, it sounds, I think she mentioned that they're young and, and for couples that marry young, when you don't have a lot of assets, like doing a hundred percent combined finances makes a lot of sense because your financial life is very simple. Um, you guys are going to grow it together over time and, and it's much easier where, I mean, honestly, if I ever had to well, I don't have to remarry, but if for whatever reason I did remarry, I'm not sure I would do combined finances. Like I have five kids, we own four pieces of real estate. Like my financial life is just very complicated. Um, and it would be hard to merge with another person's financial life. So that's like the great thing when you're young and you're broke and you don't have kids, like combined finances is often a great solution. Um, 
But I would just take that first step and start to that that one hour money meeting a month is going to be so important at the beginning of a relationship to get on the same page, to talk through these things. Um, you know, other than your checking accounts, uh, savings account, emergency fund, those can all be really great combined finances. Um, our retirement accounts are naturally separate. And I think credit card debt, especially, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe the first 10 years of marriage uh, should be separate because it. I don't know why this always works out, but it always feels like the person who gets the debt in the divorce is always the spouse's debt for something that they were really angry that they bought in the first place. <laughs> like, <laughs> I hate that he collected comic books and now I have $20,000 of comic book debt that I'm on the hook to pay. You know, in um, a, not the, in a and, divorce, Jillian, you're getting a car with the most amazing tent ever. I just want you to know that's, uh, <laughs> 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 oh man, that joke didn't land. Cause that was in the last episode. You would, you got to go listen to 300, <laughs> got to go listen to episode yeah. 300 to get that. <laughs> we chuckled, Jonathan. We chuckled. <laughs> Courtesy laugh yeah. from the sideline. But line. especially, yeah, any debt that you would like that it's kind of your debt. I think it's okay to keep that separate, like your car debt. Um, you don't necessarily need, if you, if you each have your own cars, it's okay to just have your name on that debt um, for simplicity's sake versus, you know, a house. I think it's usually a better idea to keep both of your names on, on that debt because that's an asset that you're growing together. And I've seen that go very poorly in a divorce where one person, all of the real estate was in, you know, the, the spouse's name, um, because it was just more convenient at the time, or it was easier or credit sc scores. And then when you go to divide that stuff up, it's more complicated and it just adds to that painful untethering process. Yeah. And I, I just want to put a little note in here. Obviously this is not legal advice, right? Like every state, there are different state laws and, and such when it comes to divorce. So, you know, clearly this is going to be a situation by situation thing. You're just talking in general and anecdotal yeah. from your experience, right? I just want to yeah. clearly make, make that obvious to everybody, but you know, the point definitely holds that, that, that that's an interesting way to like mentally approach this. Like you said, like, Hey, we're buying this house together because that's mm -hmm. something we're growing together. That's I, I like, I like that concept. So there's a couple of things that stood out to me there. Um, one is I love how you put the emphasis. Is this a, a couple that's relatively early on in their financial journey, or it's a second marriage with complicated assets or, you know, a much later marriage with complicated assets. And I think when we talked to Jean Chatsky and I'm not sure the episode, she really talked about that idea of the budget, the yours, mine and ours, especially for the latter. And you were describing this, I'm bringing in real estate. I'm bringing in, you know, several children into this marriage. Like it's, there's a lot more here and to test the waters, you have your account for your current life. I have my accounts for my current life. And then let's start with the test the waters with a joint account where as our comfort level in this new marriage grows and we have a better lay of the land, we can start bringing things over, but we don't feel forced or pressured to do it, you know, at the I do. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention there is specifically maybe this, and it is a little bit of a boundary statement. What if you're getting married to someone, one person has good credit, one person has bad credit, and they say, can you co-sign for me? You know, I can't get a credit card on my own. Can you co-sign for me? This is a really dangerous question. There's a lot of emotional strings attached to a question like this. And I, to Jillian's point, the longer I sat on it, the more uncomfortable I am with it. I would not co-sign on a credit card at a new marriage. And Brad, but, but I am curious, and, and this, both of you can answer this, Brad. Is there any difference between co-signing on a credit card versus having a credit card with an authorized user in your mind? Oh, that's interesting. I, I honestly don't know the distinction. I'm not sure yeah. uh, legally what the distinction would be. That's, that's a really good question. We need to get an answer to that. And I'm not sure how, how it affects your credit score. Like, I don't know if there's much benefit for the authorized user on, on boosting your credit score either. I'm not sure. Yeah. People anecdotally say there is benefit to adding an authorized user, but yeah, I've, I've never confirmed that personally, but people do say that's a good way. Just like if you're thinking about getting your kids to have a, an establish a credit score again, anecdotally, people talk about, oh, I added my child as an authorized user at 12. Right. But again, that you're, you're hoping that this is a situation where the person who's telling you that, like that they're treating their 
credit score properly, that they're paying on time and in full every month, right? Like, or otherwise, like that wonderful gift to your child could be a real nightmare. So, uh, yeah, it, well, that's here, something I, I've no, I don't have any firsthand experience of. Here is kind of why I was bringing it up as potentially a softer no, if you needed to do that, you trust them, but you recognize best practices. Like the cosigner thing makes you very nervous in a cosign situation. My understanding is once you sign off on it and they go get the credit, you're on the hook for any decisions they make. And you have no visibility until it all crashes into the wall. Whereas with an authorized user, it's in your ecosystem. Any purchases they make go onto your card. The cards are all linked to one account. And that's why it's a much safer. If you revoke the authorized usership, yes, you definitely did pay for anything they purchased, but it's inside of your ecosystem, not off in a silo where they're able to make purchases that are against your interest and they're hiding it from you, financial infidelity but you're legally on the hook for it. That's the danger. That's the danger zone that Jillian's talking about. You find out in the divorce that you're paying for the ridiculous levels of debt. The authorized user, yes, there might be financial bad behavior, but it's happening in front of your eyes and in your account. So it might soften the note. If the real goal here, and you feel like this is a marital, if the real goal here is we want to be able to commingle finances, be able to share transactions, be able to have a tool that we can use look into potentially as a counter offer. If this is the thing, why don't we look into an authorized user scenario as opposed to me co-signing? And I would not co-sign for anybody. Go get it on your own, figure it out on your own, but I'm not going to have the blindness around. Because again, my social security number, my credit score is attached to something that I have no visibility on. That's not fair to me. You know, so I think there's some way of communicating and then having a softer alternative that may, if the real target was financial tools that we can use, as we start building our life, that could potentially make more sense. But I do think there's a larger conversation. This goes back to the workbook. I mean, that's one maybe point of contention, a new marriage. How do we make purchases? How do we plan for that? The question behind that is what are our goals and what is, what is our life cost? What's, you know, what is our income? What are our expenses? Do we have a gap? What do we want to do with the gap? And the way that you engage in yeah. that, I think is through some guided conversation. Um, the one thing I might do, depending on the relationship, is if I had a strong credit limit set on it, like it was like a five hundred or a thousand dollar limit that I could, because the place it unravels is when it's like ten or twenty or thirty thousand dollars of debt. But if it's a thousand dollars, like okay, I can swallow that pill um, and move on and. It's not something I'm going to spend a few years bitterly paying off. Maybe. But the question is, can, you know, when they use that effectively, can they get it up? Because you're, you're often rewarded yeah. with great payments by, hey, we want to increase your credit. Would you like for us to increase it to five? And do they still need the cosigner to sign off on the increase in credit limit? Maybe, maybe not. Do you really want to, you know, risk that? And this, again, goes to the question of like, this is not about being controlling. It is about personal liability. It's about, you know, I, I don't want to control your finances. I don't want to micromanage what you're doing, but I can't sign off on something where I have no visibility into it because I am on the hook for it. So maybe there's a way that we could, you know, do this in another capacity or, you know, let's just do a joint checking account and we'll both get debit cards for the account. It's, it's effectively the same idea. Would you prefer the authorized user or would you prefer the joint checking option? All right. So relationships and money. It's something that we'll keep coming back to. Please, you know, send us your, uh, send us your questions, send us your voicemail. Jillian will be back on the show several times this year. And we'll just kind of aggregate your questions. You know, if this prompted you, but it maybe missed some nuance, send us your voicemails and your feedback, and we'll put those together and we'll, we'll do additional shows on, on this very important topic uh, for the community. Uh, we were referencing a workbook in a digital course, which Jillian has been putting together for the last year. And if you're interested in accessing that or checking that out further, you can go to jillianjohnsrud.com slash O-N-E slash O-N-E, jillianjohnsrud.com slash one. And she's put all the resources there for you. Just go to jillianjohnsrud.com slash one. That's O-N-E. All right. Well, Jillian, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you guys so much for having me. And anyone listening to this, again, um, if you actually do have a question around relationships and money and you would like to have it featured on the show, uh, I said, leave us a voicemail. Uh, to do that, just go to choosefi.com slash voicemail. We'll feature your question on an upcoming episode. All right, guys. Again, a huge thanks to Jillian. And uh, I think you see how important these conversations are and really how tricky they are. But there is some strategies, some best practices here when you're navigating this. And I appreciate Jillian helping us with that framework. 
Uh, Brad, excited, you know, as we start to, to bring this episode to a close, I just wanted to point out, I noticed the, this, this bobblehead behind you and one of them looks kind of <laughs> like you and one of them looks a little bit like me. And I don't know, man, is that a sign that we've made it? Tell me more about that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, this was uh, one of those funny kind of things. Uh, so this past this past weekend, I get a package in UPS and I open it up and it's from allstarmoney.com and The Motley Fool. And it was a bobblehead of me and you, which is absolutely hilarious. Evidently, we they put us, I have to say, I'm really just incredibly honored. They put us in kind of like a hall of fame that they called the originals. So it's allstarmoney.com slash originals. And what's cool is this is uh, J Money. So J Money, who we know and love from the website Budgets Are Sexy originally. And he had a website called Rockstar Finance a number of years ago that he basically highlighted like the three best articles from the personal finance world. And he's actually now recreating this with our friends at The Motley Fool, which is awesome. So uh, now it's even more uh, fire related. So it looks like J Money is, is moving even more into the FI world. So it's just a neat thing. You can sign up for a once a day email from him. And it's just kind of his he went through and curated the the best articles of that day. So really, really neat. We love the Molly Fool. We love Jay Money. So yeah, it was uh, pretty hilarious to get a, a bobblehead of. Uh, of well, ourselves. let's get that bobblehead a little bit closer. Can you grab it off your shelf and bring it up here? It won't mean anything to someone listening to the show. But you, now just just poke the head. Just 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 tap it. Tap it on the side. Look at that. Look look. <laughs> Man, it looks just <laughs> like us. It's eerie. Okay. Uh, <laughs> no, huge. Text. Terrible for podcast audio, but uh, you can see it on our YouTube channel. Uh, yeah, let's just add to that. I miss Rockstar Finance. It, it, you know, when uh, he ended up uh, leaving that project, uh, I think it ended up being uh, sold off. And then it just wasn't like it didn't, you know, it, it's not there anymore. And it was actually, it was a really cool thing what they were doing for the community. So to see Motley Fool, see what that was and why it was valuable for the community to have that curation out there and then to help J money, bring it, uh, back to life really is, uh, it's, it's going to be pretty cool to see. And I'm glad they're tackling this project together. So yeah, check it out. We'll have a link in the show notes for this episode, but if you want to check it out, just go to allstarmoney.com and, uh, it, I'm sure they have some pretty epic things planned for it. All right, my friends, the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road, less traveled.